I'm your host, Jimmy Church. This is the 2021 Conscious Life Expo. And this is my UFO panel tonight, Future Contact, which I do every year with the Conscious Life Expo. Linda Moulton Howe, she is joining us. Linda, good evening. Hi, it's great to be here. And, you know, when it comes to trying to understand what the real facts are, behind the past 70 years of government cover-up since World War II about UFOs and ETs. I would like to start tonight with two government insiders who have given me information since the 1980s about an extraterrestrial civilization that they both say comes from the binary star system Zeta Reticuli 1 and 2 in the lower right of this illustration, about 38 light years from our sun and earth. My sources and I am going to be in kind of a discussion that I'm going to go through with you and I will be using the name Sherman for them to honor their request for anonymity, combining them in one name. The ETs from that binary star system, Zeta Reticuli 1 and 2, which have interacted with Earth for millennia are called EBENS by the government, an acronym for extraterrestrial biological entities. Sherman worked for the secret group MJ-12 or Majestic 12, established by President Harry Truman in September of 1947 after several UFO crashes in New Mexico. Eventually in the 1990s, I learned from an East Coast source who made special computers for the Pentagon that MJ-12 had evolved to a different letter number code, all in secret. It is E2SCD, another acronym for the Extraterrestrial Space Command Directorate. That was the first time I heard the name Space Command mentioned. And the context was UFOs and ETs. Both men who have helped me have periodically given me information over the years, which I have no way to prove. But tonight, I want to share with you some important excerpts of my interviews with them from my third book, Glimpses of Other Realities, Volume 2, High Strangeness. Both men did work for the highly classified Majestic 12 group which produced this restricted Psalm 101 Special Operations Manual to train secret military units for top secret assignments related to, as the title says, extraterrestrial entities and technology recovery and disposal. The cover and the manual's 30 pages were produced from Tri-X negatives anonymously sent to UFO investigator Don Berliner postmarked March 7th, 1994. Berliner asked retired McDonnell Douglas aerospace engineer, Robert Wood, PhD, for help. Bob got the Tri-X film developed into photographs for study. Eventually, he and his son, Ryan Wood, produced this training manual replica from those photographs. Inside on page six of section 10, is description of extraterrestrial biological entities. Examination of remains recovered from wreckage of UFOBs, which was an acronym the government used in the early uh, decade of the 40s to the 50s, indicates that extraterrestrial biological entities might be classified into two distinct categories as follows. EBA type one. These entities are humanoid and might be mistaken for human beings of the oriental race if seen from a distance. They are bipedal, five to five feet, four inches in height and weigh 80 to 100 pounds. Proportionally, they are similar to humans. Although the cranium, the head is somewhat larger and more rounded. The skin is a pale chalky yellow in color, thick and slightly pebbled in appearance. 
The eyes are small, wide set, almond shaped with brownish black irises with very large pupils. The whites of the eyes are not like that of humans, but have a pale gray cast. The ears are small and set low on the skull. The nose is thin and long, and the mouth is wider than in humans and nearly lipless, no lips. There is no apparent facial hair and very little body hair, that being very fine and confined to the underarm and the groin area. The body is thin and without apparent body fat, but the muscles are well developed. The hands are small with four long digits, but no opposable thumb. The outside digit is jointed in a manner as to be nearly opposable, and there is no webbing between the fingers as in humans. The legs are slightly but noticeably bowed out and the feet are somewhat splayed and proportionally large. That was EBA type one. Now EBA type two. These entities are humanoid, but different from type one in many respects. They are bipedal, three feet, five inches to four feet, two inches in height and weigh 25 to 50 pounds. Proportionally, the head is much larger than humans or type one EBITs, the cranium being much larger and elongated. The eyes are very large, slanted and nearly wrap around the side of the skull. They are black with no white showing. There is no noticeable brow ridge and the skull has a slight peak that runs over the crown. The nose consists of only two small slits which sit high above the slit-like mouth. There are no external ears. The skin is a pale bluish gray color, being somewhat darker on the back of the creature and is very smooth and fine celled. There is no hair on either the face or the body, and these creatures do not appear to be mammalian. The arms are long in proportion to the legs and the hands have three long tapering fingers and a thumb which is nearly as long as the fingers. The second finger is thicker than the others, but not as long as the index finger. The feet are small and narrow and four toes are joined together with a membrane. It is not definitely known where either type of creature originated, but it seems certain they did not evolve on earth. It is further evident, although not certain, that they may have originated on two different planets. I showed the manual copy to Sherman and asked, in the Psalm 101 Majestic 12 training manual, extraterrestrial biological entities are broken down into two groups, EBA-1 and EBA-2. EBA-2 is described as smaller. Is that an android or an independent gray extraterrestrial group? Sherman told me that he thought type one and type two in that manual were connected as both types of androids. Androids. They could do work for either the Ebens or the Greys, separating out Greys as a completely different ET species from the Ebens. And I asked, well, what is the relationship between the Greys and the Ebens? He said, they were enemies at one time. They are supposed to live without war today, but the Ebens have no control over the Greys. The Greys do their thing and the Ebens do theirs. And I ask, well, is there a pecking order among the alien types? And he answered, well, to the best of our knowledge, no cooperation exists between the different alien groups. And I think there was a war about 6,000 years ago between the Ebens and the blonde types over territorial rights to a planet somewhere. I don't know if it was out at Zeta Reticuli or around here in our solar system or what. 
and then, then I said, so both groups, the Ebens and the blonde humanoids, make android creatures to do work for them on different planets? Well, that's what I understand. Androids come in many different types. Insect, humanoid, MIBs, men in black, and many others, and have an advanced implanted brain that can operate on its own or by remote control. Ironically, we think some of these genetically engineered creatures have a higher intelligence than their creators. Is Bigfoot working for any of these groups? I don't know. Well, so there are the Ebens, Greys, the blonde humanoids. Are they the main groups that you know about? He answered, yes. And then below the Ebens are the big nose types, Eben science types, men in black reptoids and small gray worker drones. Are they all sort of pecking order down? And he said, yes. And sometimes I think they have made or work with small blonde humanoids, which really confuses the picture. And I said, well, what about the reptilian humanoids? He answered, the androids can be reptilian. Both groups, the Ebens and the blonde humanoids can make robots or androids that can be anything they want them to be. Both groups know how to mix and match genomes in DNA easily. Remember, they are millions of years advanced beyond us. And then I asked, what about the animal mutilations? And he said, the animal mutilations did occur and were performed by the aliens. We, meaning the United States government, and perhaps an agreement with Eisenhower is what he alluded to. Perhaps we allowed them to conduct experiments using animals, not just cattle. I don't know if you are aware or not, but there were a lot of moose and a caribou found mysteriously dead in the Arctic and Alaska. We think it was part of the Eben experimentation, but we couldn't figure out what happened. They wanted to conduct experiments better animals than humans, but to complicate matters, to cover up the animal mutilations, our government launched a military program to test certain biological drugs on animals. This was to cover up the alien mutilation program. And I said, do the Ebens themselves excise the tissue from the animals? Sherman answered, after we had more communications with the Ebens, they explained to us, look, you have to understand that in an advanced civilization, you have robots and androids to do these things. And we began to understand that the Eben androids can be anything. The androids can be configured any way the Ebens want for whatever mission the Ebens want carried out. The Ebens are controlling a big part of an operation concerning Earth, and we can't control everything they do. But I can tell you the Ebens are big environmentalists, huge. They would make the Sierra Club look like brownie scouts. They were so worried about our nuclear tests and nuclear materials being exploded and contaminating not only the Earth, but the universe in general. Sherman, do you mean that our atomic bombs impacted other life forms or even other dimensions? Right. So that's one of the things the Ebens were very vocal about. But Sherman, if extraterrestrial biological entities that you call Ebens are so concerned about atomic testing, and have been manipulating DNA and already evolving primates for eons and actually made us homo sapien. Who inspired Albert Einstein to come up with E equals MC squared that could potentially destroy us and the earth? He said, I don't know, but I have been told there are time cycles. 
The Ebens know what happened in the past and they know what will happen in the future because they understand that time spirals. It goes round and round and that the same type of events happen at specific points in the spirals. And they want to know to somehow change the catastrophes that await mankind. So they are now trying to influence us and to convince us that we have to change because they know the future and we don't want that future. They don't want us to continue on this same destructive path. They don't directly interfere, but they try to convince us to change things. But Sherman, if they made us, put us here, and we have to live it, why are we still on a destructive spiral? He said, because the first time around, the Ebens didn't like it. They don't want the same catastrophe to happen again. Maybe like that asteroid that slammed into the Yucatan and destroyed all the dinosaur life. This time humans would be the dominant earth life that would be destroyed by a big asteroid hit. The Ebens realize our society is much more complex than theirs because of all the different races. It's easier to keep their civilization on track because it's just one race, but ours is so different. They figure that they made a mistake and they are now trying to, to direct us in the right way of living and preventing us from, contam from contaminating not just Earth, but the whole universe. Well, from your point of view, are Ebens the only non-humans that have experimented genetically on this planet? All I know is that the Ebens started an experiment here but they couldn't keep out other space travelers. Word got out that this planet was a strange place to visit and that different experiments were not going the way the Ebens wanted. Part of the Ebens problems might be because there are bad guys doing experiments too that might harm us. And that really confuses matters when it comes to telling who wants to help humans and who doesn't. Well, in abduction reports, People describe creatures that look like praying mantis insects. What are those? And what about the tall blondes who are human looking aliens about five to six feet tall? Yes, they have blonde or real pale hair. Females have longer hair, very slender, nose and eyes are similar to humans, but they have invisible double lids, apparently for filtering light or something. It is confusing though, because the Ebens have made humanoids that actually look human, a spitting image of a high cheekboned human with Scandinavian features. And so have the bad guys made blondes. Well, who are the bad guys? The greys. And why are they bad? They lie and they cause problems among the citizenry. You mean human abductions and animal mutilations? Well, officially, the government has never acknowledged that the aliens abducted anybody. And I said, yeah, but we know that non-humans are abducting humans. And he laughed. Yes, you could probably make a good argument for that. But I never read anything official where MJ-12 admitted it. Everything I've read is about the cooperation between the Ebens and the humans in the red book and the yellow book. It's all about the Ebens, nothing about the greys, other than what the Ebens write about greys in the yellow book. And that's not just about greys, but all the other different races the Ebens have come upon in their exploration of the universe and how they view those different other races. What is the red book? We. The United States, MJ-12, we wrote the Red Book. 
based on the information we've gathered ourselves about the Ebens. Well, what is the difference between the greys and the Ebens? The greys are similar in appearance, but they wear a different uniform or suit with different insignias and colors. I don't remember exactly which, but the greys have crude telepathic abilities compared to the Ebens and the greys are more reckless and they aren't as compassionate as the Ebens. Well, do you have any understanding about what the Ebens want after the millions of years of interactions with our planet? No, except that they set us in motion and they are watching us grow like watching children grow is the way it's been described to me. Well, the Ebens must have their hands full if this warring humanity is what they created. I don't know. There's so much out there that we just don't understand. Well, if there is a finite number of souls and the Ebens are concerned about humans damaging souls by damaging our body containers with violence, why do you think the Vatican says there should be no birth control or abortion? It's almost as if the Catholic Church is promoting the creation of containers in a finite soul universe. That's a difficult position to take. Well, it's a good question, and I don't know. Has anybody discussed whether the Ebens check out souls the way we check out books for information? No, I never heard that. Well, some abductees think our bodies and souls are checked out like CD-ROMs so that all experiences and knowledge can be played back. That way, the aliens don't have to literally live here to experience and know everything that has happened here over eons. It's an interesting possibility, but I don't know. If the Ebens made us and put us here, there has to be a reason. Are we a garden growing containers for souls to be harvested for some reason? It's another good question. And all I can tell you is that one elderly man with MJ-12 told me, you don't want to know that when I ask him about souls and why the Ebens made us. Sherman, some abductees also say that the main reason for the animal mutilations and human abductions has to do with the creation of a hybrid species. But no one knows whether the hybrids are supposed to replace the current homo sapien container model. There is a sense that whatever the non-humans are up to, it has something to do with survival, their survival and ours. Maybe, all I know is that the Ebens are supposed to have manipulated DNA in primates long before humans were created. So there must have been a series of experiments like Neanderthal before Cro-Magnon. And Neanderthal's gone. So who knows what's on the agenda for humans? Some abductees say that they've had their minds literally taken out and information added about great changes in the future and the existence of many more dimensions in the cosmos than we know. And I was involved in this 1984 hypnosis session with a commercial artist who was driving with his wife when suddenly a cerulean blue beam of light, kind of bluish green, surrounded their car and they were lifted up from a Colorado highway near Longmont, north of Denver. It was Thanksgiving week of 1980. Both remembered consciously looking down as their car rose up, seeing the tops of trees below them. And then the car was lowered into a forest. Both the husband and wife felt compelled in their minds to get out of their car and walk toward a craft glowing in pale yellow light that was resting on what looked like curved erector set legs. In an opening on the side of a disc-shaped craft was a tall, hairless humanoid wearing a long, dark blue robe with a raised collar. The couple both were drawn to walk toward the tall, handsome humanoid. But when they got into the craft, 
They were disturbed. They even felt tricked that instead of the blue caped humanoid who had invited them into the craft in their minds telepathically, that instead they were confronted by this gray skinned, large headed being wearing a goldish leotard fitting suit with a strange, large double layered collar, quite different than the tall humanoid in the sweeping blue cape. The husband said, quote, they've got big heads. They aren't like we are. Somebody's talking, but it's like they're picking my mind, like I don't have any control. My brain, it's like there's a tunnel that goes through my mind to theirs. My head is gone or is going almost like a shaft through my head, something with my brain to his. I don't know if it goes to him, connects it somehow. Our minds are connected. It's like a tube. Maybe it's light. It's like a gray light, gray brown light. It's like everything pulled out of my head. It's like a waterfall and everything is gone. There's a terrible sound, but I can't tell what it is. Only it's piercing high-pitched, and it's coming from my head. It's like I can see all of my thoughts, like goo. Everything in my mind is stripped. They've got the whole thing. They've just pulled everything right out of me." Close quote. The husband was completely silent for a few minutes under hypnosis. Nothing that Richard Sigismund, who was doing the hyp hypnosis, said or did, could get the husband to speak or even to move. And then after many minutes on his own, he began to whisper and his voice slowly got louder as he described what the alien beings put in his mind. Quote, there's more to it than anybody knows. There's more to life, more to the world. There's more to everything than anybody knows. More dimensions, things coexisting. There are other dimensions, more than three dimensions. Everywhere, it all works together. Everything coexists. There are different dimensions we can't go into. These beings want to know about us people, close quote. But is the alien long-time interest in manipulation of Homo sapien because they genetically manipulated already evolving primates into the different standing up models of humanoids on earth and have continued to monitor us while waiting for what? That same idea of a prime intelligence making different clones or hybrids or androids or cyborgs to meet many different needs and missions came up indirectly in an alleged briefing for the newly elected US President Ronald Reagan in an alleged highly classified meeting at Camp David, March 6 to 8, 1981. Directing the meeting, with insiders from the CIA, NSA, DIA, was Reagan's appointee, William Casey. He was appointed for the CIA director. A transcript of the alleged Camp David discussion was reprinted at the Serpo website in 2007. I shared a copy with a Washington DC whistleblower contact who has helped me through the years. He told me he knows there was such a briefing with Reagan at Camp David, March 6 to 8, 1981, about UFOs and ETs. And that intel analyst confirmed for me that the Colorado couple was dealing with what our government calls EBANs, extraterrestrial biological ent entities. Today, I can add the probability that types called EBA-1, depicted in the charcoal on the left, are advanced enough in genetics to manufacture 
EBA type 2, shown on the right. So one form of genetic android can be making other androids to do work even for it. And throughout our solar system and through the Milky Way galaxy and beyond, it is my understanding there are huge numbers of androids and clones and cyborgs. That means abductees have usually been handed and handled by the small black-eyed little guys, not the prime even intelligence that made these little guy androids. This release, 27A Reagan Briefing, was included in a series of 35 reports from 2005 to 2007, posted in order to quote, facilitate the gradual release of confidential documents pertaining to a top secret exchange program of 12 US military personnel to Serpo, a planet of Zeta Reticuli in that solar system, or there's two solar systems, between the years 1965 to 1978. The information began to be released on November 2nd, 2005, by a retired senior official with the US Defense Intelligence Agency who calls himself anonymous. Until he chooses to make his name known, this is the way he will be represented here. Anonymous reports that he is not acting individually and is part of a group of six DIA personnel who work together as an alliance, three current and three former employees. He is their chief spokesman in this Serpo material, close quote. The following excerpts are allegedly from a transcript of an audio tape that was recorded at Camp David, Maryland for President Ronald Reagan on March 6th to March 8th, 1981, about the subject of, quote, unidentified flying objects and extraterrestrial visitation of Earth, close quote. Leading the discussion was CIA Director William Casey along with CIA advisors and a caretaker of the ET history. Casey was Reagan's campaign manager in 1980, and President Reagan asked Casey to become CIA director from 1981 to 1987. That means this briefing on March 6 to 8, 1981, was only two months after Ronald Reagan first took office on January 20th, 1981, as president of the United States. The caretaker says to President Reagan, quote, the United States of America has been visited by extraterrestrial visitors since 1947. We have proof of that, close quote. Now, the truth is there was a crash retrieval six years before Roswell events. That was in Cape Girardeau, Missouri, allegedly in April of 1941 discussed in leaked Majestic 12 documents from which a neutronic propulsion device was retrieved and later delivered to Robert Oppenheimer when he began work at Los Alamos, New Mexico to produce the first American atomic bomb. The caretaker continues. However, we also have some proof that Earth has been visited for many thousands of years by various races of extraterrestrial visitors. Mr. President, I'll just refer to those visitors as ETs. In July, 1947, a remarkable event occurred in New Mexico. During the storm, two ET spacecraft crashed. One crashed southwest of Corona, New Mexico, and one crashed near Dadel, New Mexico. The US Army eventually found both sites and recovered all of the debris and one live alien. I'll refer to this live alien as EBA-1. We also referred to it as NOAA. President Reagan, can we classify them, connect them with anything earthly? The caretaker, no, Mr. President. They don't have any similar characteristics of a human, 
with exception of their eyes, ears, and a mouth. Their internal body organs are different. Their skin is entirely different from human. We could not classify any part of the aliens with humans. They had blood and skin, although considerably different than human. Their eyes had two different eyelids, probably because their home planet was very bright. Allegedly, the Ebens are from a desert planet called Serpo, where skies are bright or dim, but never dark, that orbits one of the Zeta Reticuli binary suns in a solar system that is 39.4 light years from Earth. The caretaker. The distance from Earth to Serpo is about 40 light years, is what he says to Ronald Reagan, so very close. And Zeta Reticuli 1 and 2 is identified as 39.4 light years from Earth. They can travel that distance in about nine of our months. I am no scientist, but as I mentioned earlier, they can travel that great distance by means of space tunnels. They seem to be able to bend the distance from one point in space to another. And just how they do this must be explained scientifically. President Reagan. Well, are they all friendly? Mr. President, says advisor number one. That is a very difficult question to answer. There are many parameters that we follow to evaluate the threat. However, we have little intelligence on four of the five, meaning ET groups that they're dealing with on Earth. We have plenty of intel on the Ebens. They've given us everything we have asked for. They have also helped us to understand the other four species. I'm afraid to say, Mr. President, and please don't misunderstand my words, but we think one of the species is very hostile. CIA Director William Casey. Mr. President, we have intelligence that would indicate this one species of aliens have abducted people from Earth. They have performed scientific and medical tests on these humans. To the best of our knowledge, no humans have been killed. But as advisor number one stated, the intelligence is from witnesses and we haven't thoroughly evaluated this intelligence. We have captured one of these hostile aliens. This gets into some very, very sensitive areas, Mr. President. I strongly suggest we end this discussion and move on to any further questions you might have and then get back to this. I don't think we are prepared to provide you with accurate answers to your questions about the potentially hostile aliens at this time in March 6 to 8, 1981. President Reagan, okay, but expect this to be given to me as soon as possible. I want to know everything about these hostile creatures. So I mean, we should start forming policies on how to deal with them. Advisor number one, do we have operational war plans on this? Advisor number one, yes, Mr. President, we have war plans on all potential threats to our country. And then CIA Director Casey asks the caretaker to give President Reagan the names of known alien groups. The caretaker, okay, Mr. President, the five species are called one, Ebens, extraterrestrial biological entities, two, archaloids, three, quadloids, four, haploids, five, Trontoloids. These names were given to the alien species by the intelligence community, specifically by MJ5. The Ebens are friendly. The Trontoloids are the dangerous ones. We call the hostile alien simply that, HAV, meaning hostile alien visitors. MJ12 placed that code on them back in the 1950s. 
President Reagan, you mean to say these HAVs have been visiting us and kidnapping our people since the 1950s? CIA Director Casey. Mr. President, we have some indication that they might have been doing this for some time, but we can be sure that the Ebens have never done this. They are extremely peaceful and would not harm a living soul, including animals, close quote. And I make an insertion here. That is not a true statement because what I've showed you tonight is that the couple in Colorado were abducted by pear-shaped headed, gray-skinned non-humans that more than one government agent has told me are like photographs of Ebens. So who is fooling who and for what reason? Back to President Reagan. My God, just knowing we have names for these things is amazing. Which one did we capture? CIA Director William Casey. Mr. President, we have a tronoloid, but it is dead. We captured it in 1961 in Canada, and we had it in captivity until 1962 when it died. Advisor number one. Mr. President, these hostile aliens are pretty sneaky. They seem to appear and disappear, which is beyond our technical understanding. They also seem to float or defy gravity. We have actual photographs of them doing this. We have a classic abduction incident that was recorded by military intelligence personnel. It happened in 1979 near a military base. President Reagan, where? Advisor number one, in New Mexico, caretaker. New Mexico is similar to the home planet of the Ebens, the Ebens from desert-like planet, and that's why they like the desert of New Mexico. Since we do not know which planet the Trontoloids come from, and he's interrupted by advisor number four. Sir, I think we do. I think the Ebens gave us that information. We know the star group. It is close to our solar system in astronomical terms, maybe 10 and a half light years away. The Trinoloids are actually closer to us than the Ebens are at Zeta Reticuli 1 and 2. It turns out there is a star with planets exactly 10.5 light years from Earth, and it is called Epsilon Eridani. The star map shows all the star systems. Here, let me get to it. The star map, this star map shows all of the star systems that lie within 12 and a half light years from our sun, which is the yellow circle. Our sun is at the center of the blue circle lines. And to the lower left, you can see I made another yellow circle that is Epsilon Eridani, 10.5 light years from our sun. And to, it's also cooler in temperature. So I made it a little more orange, I made our sun at the center yellow. And uh, Epsilon Eridani is a dwarf star compared to our yellow G spectrum sun. But both of these suns and their solar systems turn out to be very similar. Epsilon Eridani has a large ring Jupiter-like gaseous planet called Epsilon Eridani b, and a second rocky planet, Epsilon Eridani c, outside the rings. And then down in the lower left of this NASA illustration is a possible third planet that orbits in one of two asteroid belts in the Epsilon Eridani system similar to the one asteroid belt in our solar system. Is, is Epsilon Eridani, is that the home to the hostile Trondoloids? President Reagan was told that in addition to the Trondoloids, 
the Ebens have cloned other races of aliens. And what you're looking at is what is called, the government calls it an archaloid, and that it is a cloned biological entity created by the Ebens. And the quadloids were also cloned, these are the praying mantis type, from two other species of praying mantis and lizards. Some abductees who encounter the eight foot tall praying mantis entity feel overwhelmed by a sense of age that they are extremely ancient. One uh, abductee told me this being put in my head that it was as old as our 4.6 billion year old solar system. And that they, the abductees feel an emotion of great sadness from these mantis beings, as if the mantis beings know a lot about humans that we do not know. Abductees have said, quote, it's like the creature was assigned to watch over our solar system and knows something very sad about us humans. The second type on the list the archaloids that were also genetically engineered by the Ebens through rapid cycle cloning. It doesn't have to go through a baby stage. They can clone full-blown adults. Our government calls these cloned biological entities, CBEs. This illustration of an archaloid shows a big hook nose, yellow vertical pupils like a snake or cat in, a large, in large dark eyes, a head with a raised knob on top, covered by a layered headdress, large ears with a technology dropping down like an earring, holding a rod with a spiral around it that is identified as a language translator. The archaloid stood back at the exit opening of an egg-shaped craft while two Ebens interacted with our American military and scientists. Allegedly, that day, April 25th, 1964, we gave the Ebens back some of their dead bodies from crashes, and they gave us some technology. The source of this, of this particular sketch are Alan Sandler and Robert Emenegger, who wrote and produced the book and TV documentary in 1974, UFOs, past, present, and future. Bob Emenegger later told me face to face that this illustration was sketched directly from a 16 millimeter film frame that was shot when the Ebens with the Arkeloid landed at Holloman Air Force Base in a formal meeting with our military and a scientist, but I have been told Holloman was a cover. It actually, the meeting occurred near the Trinity site on White Sands, and that date was April 25th, 1964. Here is another sketch of an archaloid gray type made by a Navy quartermaster in 1972 based in Oahu, Hawaii, who saw black and white photos of five and a half foot tall extraterrestrials. Three big nosed archaloids genetically created by the Ebens with rapid cycle cloning were standing in a cement holding room in a black and white photograph that the Navy quartermaster saw in 1972 while on duty in Oahu, Hawaii. He said the noses were huge and bent below dark slanted eyes that had bright vertical pupils like a snake or a cat. The name Archaloid given by US government insiders probably relates to the ancient Greek word archon, meaning ruler or lord. And here on the left is an archaloid, big nose gray in a ropey headdress, vertical pupil eyes, huge bent nose, holding a telepathic communication rod at Holloman Air Force Base, New Mexico on April 25th, 1964, when the US government had a meeting with the Ebens and this archaloid stood watch. I've also been told that that rod 
it may inactivate the language center in the brain with telepathy, but it may also give out loud English. If your brain is a, an English speaking brain, you would hear in the air. It can go telepathic or oral. On the right carved in ancient stone is the Sumerian sun god Shamash. Also in ropey headdress, as depicted in Sumerian clay images. The eyes have large vertical pupils like a cat or reptile. The coiled rod in Sumerian text is described as a communication device. The implication is that the rods in Sumeria and Egyptian carvings were used by archaeoids to communicate with and manage and control the Homo sapien sapien created by manipulation of DNA in already evolving primates to produce workers for Mesopotamia ruled by off-world overlords, the archaeoids. But evolving primates were deliberately kept ignorant of the true big picture. Government insiders run scared when they realize that the ancient Mesopotamian overlords were actually some form of archaeoids that humans have worshipped as Sumerian or Anunnaki gods. How ironic that the Ebens made the archaeoids and then the Ebens and the archaeoids made Homo sapien who turned around and worshipped the archaeoids. So the Reagan briefing introduces the US president to a big picture of Ebens using rapid cycle cloning to genetically create big-nosed archaeoids and the four-fingered quadloids that are a hybrid mix of praying mantis and lizards. And the further revelation that the genetically skilled other intelligences manipulated DNA in already evolving primates to create various models of Homo sapien over millennia that had been subjects of an even social experiment for thousands, perhaps millions of years. That could explain why Earth has been such a haunted planet with so many mysterious phenomena and why power structures have always ruled with secrecy. In their experimentation, it might be vital to the Ebens to keep humans in the dark about what we really are why we are and if our destiny is to ultimately thrive and spread out through the solar system, the Milky Way galaxy and beyond in allyship with the Ebens, Archaeoids, Quadloids and Heploloids. But what about the hostile Trontoloids? There is one startling answer in the President Reagan briefing in March, 1981 when advisor number four talks about the technology of the dangerous trontoloids. Advisor number four, Mr. President, the trontoloid technology is probably 1000 years more advanced than ours, maybe even more. Some of their materials are not found on this planet, strange materials, nothing like earth. We found several strange spots on the Eben and Trontoloid star charts. We concluded these spots were space tunnels, as the Ebens described them, shortcuts from one point of space to another. According to the Ebens, the Trontoloids use a different form of propulsion. Something like matter versus antimatter, a great deal of energy is released but we don't have the capability to do that. Mr. President, these trontoloid aliens can imitate humans. They can look like blonde humans. However, they are not blonde, but ugly looking insects. They can imitate looking like humans, President Reagan. How in the world do they do that? They have the ability to change their bodies. 
as I said before, they are a thousand years ahead of us in technology and probably every other science. So which tall or short blonde Nordics might be used as camouflage for trontoloids that President Reagan was told were actually dangerous insects? Or are some blondes and red-haired beings trying to help android humanity, such as the archangel Michael, who historically has fought off dragons and serpents? I have also been told that about 2,500 years ago, the Ebens genetically experimented with DNA changes in humans living in Bhutan, Tibet, and Nepal. The result was that some of those altered humans were transplanted to Central America, specifically the Mayans were related to that genetic experimentation. My Washington military source told me that the Ebens who made us and put us here, watch us live and grow. The Ebens have been here since before the beginning of the dinosaurs, at least 270 million years ago. I asked him what happened that caused almost total annihilation of Earth life, including the wipeout of the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. He said, quote, well, I read in the yellow book <clears throat> an Eben three-dimensional, it's like a holographic book, comes up with 3D pictures, and it's of the history of Earth. The Ebens knew back then, 65 to 66 million years ago, that a very large asteroid was going to hit the Earth. The Ebens wrote that they were saving one of each species that was on this planet, not just the dinosaurs, but the ants and insects, flies, snakes, fish, they even said they took one of everything to save all the species before the asteroid hit. It's a Noah's Ark rescue story? Right, he answered. And I guess they've experimented with life forms here on Earth ever since. But what bothers us is that the Ebens can do most anything they want. They could have evaporated that asteroid, even if it was big. They could have moved it into another timeline. They've demonstrated that for us before, but they didn't. Does that mean the Ebens wanted to get rid of their dinosaur experiment? And what came next was the rise of mammals. Humans are primate mammals that apparently the Ebens created. Maybe we are an android experiment like they made and experimented with the archaeoids. So would the Ebens save us if a big asteroid was headed for Earth? When you boil the secret Reagan intelligence briefing down, it's about one prime intelligence, the Ebens that genetically made with rapid cycle cloning, the next two ET species on the list of five types held by the CIA, DIA, all of the intelligence agencies that are involved with supporting MJ-12 and Majestic 12 since 1947. That means those two, the archaeoids and quadloids, would be equivalent to AI androids made to do service for the Ebens. And then allegedly, what do the Ebens do according to the presidential briefing? The Ebens put the archaeoids with the big noses out in the Milky Way galaxy, including the probability that the big nose archaeoids with the elongated heads and the ropey headdresses had something to do with the Anunnaki and Sumerians on Earth. And then the Ebens used the quadloid praying mantis lizard hybrids to be scientific overseers of other planetary life seeding projects. 
do the archaeoids and quadloids know their true history any more than we homo sapiens sapien know ours? Either way, if the Ebens or Anunnaki manipulated DNA in already evolving primates on Earth a couple of million years ago or less, is it fair to ponder that those first Earth humans were artificial intelligences for those that made us from manipulating genes just like robotic lab scientists today on Earth are manipulating wires and metals and plastics to replace artificial programmed intelligence in robots? Are we humans actually someone else's androids? And now in the 21st century, without yet being publicly introduced to our alien artificial intelligence makers, we ourselves, are now creating other intelligences to be soldiers, truck drivers, cooks, and housekeepers. But what we are making so far is in the machine category and not yet full-blown other organic, artificially produced intelligence. But just a couple of years ago, there were headlines that human scientists have now produced the first primate clones, these two identical macaque monkeys. They were created by somatic cell nuclear transfer, the same process that created the first clone sheep dolly in 1996. Instead of thinking of AI as metallic machines made and controlled by humans to be weapons, soldiers, truck drivers, household help, and many other services, which is what's happening on Earth right now. Maybe we should realize that genetic manipulation to make clones, androids, hybrids, and cyborgs has long been the even process for distributing their civilizations, intelligences, and geopolitical control to other planets, solar systems, and galaxies. This past year, I interviewed astrophysicist Brian Green at Columbia University in New York City. I asked Professor Green, it almost seems inevitable the Cro-Magnon Homo sapiens sapien will ultimately be replaced by cyborgs. Professor Green answered, yes, and many people find that distressing and frightening. And if that's the way things evolve, I'm perfectly fine with it. I'm not particularly wedded to this biological organic form in which we currently reside. And if it turns out, that this is a stepping stone en route to a form of life and consciousness that resides in digital and a more technologically oriented housing like cyborgs. I'm okay with that. In fact, maybe that's the way that we will achieve a kind of immortality. I mean, in the future. Our quote unquote cyborg descendants may look back on us with pity. You know how sad it was that there was that phase during which this wondrous thing called consciousness and this wondrous thing called life was housed in such a delicate framing that it could only persist for say a hundred years. How terribly profoundly sad that so many generations of humans had to live with that kind of constraint of a flesh and blood human body. Absolutely incredible presentation, Linda. Thank you so much. Thank and you. And now we've got, we're not done. And see, this is the thing, <laughs> Linda. You get the vibe. Uh, three days of a conference. We're now late in the fourth quarter on Sunday night, and it's like hang in there, right? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, right? How many of these have yeah. we done? 
when when you get to Sunday night and it's just so much fun, we all the energy that was spent all weekend long, and and we get there to Sunday night. Champagne. For the last, <laughs> that's right. As I was just saying to Rita, I said it's Sunday night. Can we go down to the lounge and and get that yeah. ice cold margarita? Um, COVID. And that's right. COVID. <laughs> Yes, and uh, and thank you so much. And now this is, um, I've been very excited about this part of of the night because you and I uh, and Nick, we've done this so many times together where it's Sunday night, it's the last panel, and we get a chance to just let it hang out there a little bit and have a free-form conversation. Um, I would like to bring in Nick. Nick, how you doing? Hi, Nick. Hi, yes, good, thanks. Hey there, Linda, Look nice to see you. Yes. The three of us, the three of us are together again, and uh, there you go. Um, now, I, I actually, I'm going to start here with this. Nick, stay with me. Linda, I am going to post my favorite picture of you and I, and this was taken <laughs> last year at the Conscious Life Expo. Kathleen, can we bring that up on the screen? Oh, Look and at, that was when we could be in the matter world. That's right. Now, Nick, I want you to take a good look at that picture. It's pretty cool, isn't it? It's my favorite picture okay. of Lyndon. Yeah, All right? it, it's great. I love your purple it, side light. Now, Linda remembers when this was taken. I introduced Linda. Um, but what you have to do to get a pick like this. Linda knows, but I'm gonna do the big reveal now. This is how we actually took the picture. Kathleen, there it is. <laughs> <laughs> That's what actually had to happen. <laughs> oh, because, isn't that a Because you had to bend down to me and look at this, Jimmy, look at this. Uh, I should bring it out. This is like the cycles in time that Roger Penrose writes about. These are the cycles of time that the ETs talk about, the CIA knows about, because this is worth the effort. It is, it is worth a, the effort. Look, uh, that pig, well, that look, picture was worth the effort. <laughs> it's my cross, it's exactly the same. It's the same. Isn't it's that the bizarre. same clothes. I, I'm wearing the same jacket. I haven't but changed. It's, it's yeah. the, my same same sweater, <laughs> my cross, and my leather jacket. Cycles. Uh, <laughs> they yes, are it everywhere. Is. There you go. So I wanted to share that with everybody. That was a moment uh, last year at the Conscious Life Expo. And here we are a year later. Linda and I are back wearing the same clothes. And <laughs> there you go. <laughs> so now... Um, I actually want to start here, um, if we may. I know that we all feel the same, that the excitement that has been building up around uh, the ET question, UFO question, call it UAP, what have you, that there is a lot of things that are going on at the very same time. But we have been through this before, haven't we? So, Nick, I'm going to start with you. Are we going to have to wait until 2022? Are we going to wait another year? Is it going to be another year? Or uh, is 2021 going to be the breakthrough that we've all been waiting for? Well, I'm afraid I don't have my crystal ball with me today. So I can't give you a definitive answer to that. But I'm going to say two things in response to it. Firstly, inevitably the ball is going to be rolled further down the field than ever before. Obviously, we've discussed, I talked about this in my presentation yesterday. I'm sure it's come up in a lot of the other talks too. The upcoming report from DNI to the Senate Intelligence Committee is going to be a big thing, irrespective of how much the media and the public actually get to see. Um, but the, the thing is going to be very important. But here's my prediction. Here's my prediction. You know, we, we talk about those sorts of things and, and the UAP task force and the U.S. Navy videos and how many more videos there might be out there. I'll make you one prediction for 2021 is that something may be connected to some of this, but 
But at the moment, not a discussion being had. But something is going to come suddenly and unexpectedly into the mix from left field just because that's the way it always happens. And so I would say to people, yes, watch very closely what happens with this report from DNI to Congress, but watch out for the unexpected. It's the unexpected that will suddenly burst upon us and take us in interesting and new directions. And I know that's a little bit of a cop-out because I don't have to, to tie that prediction to any specific thing, but just my experience of this tells me that something is coming that perhaps at the moment isn't on our radar, pun intended. Now, and Linda, I'm going to get that, I, well. Linda, hold on, yeah. hold on, uh, hold hold that note for a second. Nick, what you're suggesting is we are looking at very specific areas all the time now where we are expecting it to come from maybe the Senate or we're expecting something from the Pentagon or TTSA or Louis Elizondo or Chris Mellon. You're saying you're suggesting that we shouldn't be looking in those directions when you least expect it, expect it. It's going to come from somewhere else. Yes, essentially, yes. I, I, I'm not saying don't look in those directions because those are very important directions. And I'm sure Lou and Chris and, and some of the other things you mentioned are absolutely going to be an important part of this and there will be good data coming. But I am saying that, that I sus you know, just experience tells me that sometimes the, the really important things come from left field. So watch for, and I don't know necessarily what it will be. Maybe it will be a particular senator breaking ranks. Maybe it will be another uh, interesting character coming out of the intelligence community, perhaps recently retired. Um, so something like that. So watch the existing players, but watch out for the new ones. Nick, I and, like that. I do. Well, uh, Linda, and, before you say, let me add one uh, Linda, thing that's important to what he said. I mean, and that hold is, on, hold on. This, that, this is <laughs> this is what we do, folks. This is what we do in private. Linda, I'll give you the opportunity for the and, but I've got to ask you the same question. You've been doing this forever. Do we have to wait another year to 2022, or do you think that 2021 finally? is going to be the breakthrough that we've been waiting for. Well, I'll add the sentence and, because <laughs> uh, in addition to unexpected things happening, I am intrigued by the fact that June 24th, the last week of June, that's the end of the 180 day countdown clock. And they preserved sources, appendices, all of the details that all of us need to look at and verify what it is that they're going to release, they have the right to keep it all classified, that part. That's right. That's Which means right. that whatever they do distribute uh, to the Secretary of Defense and the NDI, the, uh, the Director of National Intelligence, it, they'll probably have a public version and they will have a classified version. But they ask in that bill, it's written in that bill, and the very fact that they requested that in the bill, that all sources, appendices, and all of that would be classified, says they're trying to sculpt, they're trying to go through narrow little avenues uh, that would open up perhaps something. But what I did tonight is, as far as I'm concerned, this is how big the real truth is. And we're talking about the tiniest baby steps, just trying to get to somebody in power that says, we are not alone in this universe. We have never been alone in this universe. And now it is time to level with you. That's what we need. Confirmation. Disclosure was in the 1940s. That was the crashes. Sure. Ever since 70 years, we've needed a government, whether it was the United States or not, to step up to the plate and tell the human family the truth. And it's been 70 years of secret policies. And I think it's because of animal mutilations and human abductions that they knew long ago. And they thought that nobody would be able to handle it. Here we are, 
2021 in the middle of a pandemic, all kinds of things. I think that humans are much, much more flexible. And if they are just leveled with and given the respect of being told the truth about our source and even our future, then maybe the planet would stop fighting itself. I agree with that. And, and I wanna go back uh, to Nick's point, Linda, with you, if I may. The report by the UAP task force, if you look at the verbiage in the bill, it appears to me, and I've poured over this and really tried to uh, get, uh, get a semblance of what is to be expected, but it looks like that report to the public is a suggestion. I don't see it as being law. I don't know if the UAP task force is, is bound by that date. I think the date is a suggestion. The 180 days is a suggestion. Going back to Nick's point, maybe we shouldn't focus on that as much because it might not happen, Linda. Nick, I think that it is congressional language. The date must be complied with. There's no wiggle room um, on the date of a report, but what they report could be light. Nick? Yeah, I, I mean, you could, yeah, sure. I, I mean, I've done this sort of thing on a number of subjects from within the British government. Uh, yes, the the report has been requested within 180 days of enactment of the COVID-19 relief bill. You can always ask for an extension on most things. And usually the way to do that is, is you would send some sort of interim report or you could come in early. And there's nothing to stop. There's nothing, it says within 180 mm -hmm. days, but let me let me just let me just clarify one point, which I think is very important. A lot of people, when this story came out, they looked in the COVID-19 relief bill and they said, "But no, it's not in there." And and the point was that originally it was in the Intelligence Authorization Act for 20 yeah. uh, for fiscal year 2021, and that got piggybacked onto the COVID-19 relief bill, but it isn't in the act, but it's linked to the act by virtue of a congressional note. But here's the really, really critical thing. Just in case there was any doubt about it, I reached out to the public affairs people at ODNI. And I said, are you aware of this? And are you going to abide by this? And I got back, yes, we are. So it is definitely going to happen. And now, uh, Jimmy, uh, uh, you guys, sure. just, a, just one fast thing. I wanted to see the original language and what I had to go through to find what uh, the, uh, the guy in Florida, uh, he uh, had that bill that was going, having to do with uh, funding and uh, government funding. And Ma then Marco COVID. Rubio. Marco yes. Rubio. And then yes. the COVID, you had to go through 5,990 pages, I'm sort of metaphorically, where you found those link pages to the 180 day countdown was in the last five or six pages of that 5,000 some hundred page bill. It was almost you coming through line items that were budgets and you hit three words. Uh, non sequitur, advanced aerial threat, as they were making dollar signs coming down on legislative lines. That's how buried it was. And I thought, and then it only has two pages. The whole thing is it, it covers two pages. And I keep thinking, do is this a sign that no one now in political office uh, feels that anybody in the world will bother ever to inquire with their representatives about what's in legislation because it's enormous and they can play games and bury things just like they did with this. But somebody clearly wanted the world to know because that's how buried yeah. it was. 
I, I agree with that. And I want to go back. Nick Nick brought up one of the, the most fascinating parts to all of this. Oh, a UFO reports coming out from a UAP task force, the Senate Intelligence Committee. They're talking about UFOs. We've got they have a classified section of this report that is there. That's the that's the juicy stuff. That's right. The question is what gets released to the public and what stays classified. I'm excited. I, I really am, but I don't know. Is it going to be a redacted page? It's going to be a blank page. Nick, what do you think they're going to put on that public side? Okay, well, I, I, was, uh, I was talking about this with John Greenwald the other day, and he had some interesting ideas, and I think I agree with him on, on this. I, I mean, and, and just to pick up Linda's point, yeah, it, it was difficult to find, but it was, easy, it was easier to find when it was just in the original Intelligence Authorization Act, um, for fiscal year 2021, and, and it was on pages 11 and 12 of, of that, and, and so that was clear. And it said, at the end, it said, the report must be unclassified, but it can have a classified annex to it. Yes. But I was discussing this with John Greenwald, and I think he and I are probably at one on this. I, I think the un... The unclassified report, I, I can I can guarantee it will be couched in terms of generalities. It will start off with something like we take the territorial integrity of United States airspace extremely seriously through a means of um, assets, be they you know radar or other parts of the air defense network. We keep a 24 hour 24 seven watch. Um, we, we take all incursions into restricted military airspace seriously, blah, blah, blah. It will probably go on to try and spin this in terms of drone, illegal drone incursions into military ranges. It will talk about new technologies, drone killing technologies, that sort of thing, and say, yeah, we, we um, think that this is a serious threat. And, and then when it's got over and it will it may have a kind of throwaway line that says with the best will in the world we we accept that it's not always possible to identify every single object or phenomena detected in our airspace uh, but we have no evidence that that there is a, a a hostile intent or whatever and then it will say and further further information on this including detailed breakdowns of the U.S. Navy videos, can be found in the annex. Says the former Just, government employee. <laughs> You've done this before, Nick. But, right? <laughs> uh, but countering that, and back to Jimmy's uh, first question about, could the, the needle be changing? The very fact that it, the whole thing the, those two pages having to do with uh, the uh, UFO aspect. The, the title is Advanced Aerial Threat, that repetition from ATIP, the repetition that we've seen for the last four or five years. That's right. And then it wants information about foreign adversaries. Foreign adversaries can be from Cydonia, they can be from Jupiter, they can be from Aldebaran, they can be from anywhere in the universe. And the way that that is written is almost as if there is a flag coming up. We're going to go further this time and we are going to reveal something about advanced aerial threats and foreign adversaries. It may be that they are finally going to touch to the world on the issue of let, what I was describing, something like the trontoloids that I, as far as I know, definitely are, uh, they exist, we know about them, and that maybe they're gonna come into this from the side. The whole planet deserves not only 70 years, but centuries of truth. And now maybe the, doors are closing. Musk is going to go to Mars. We're going to start having archaeology on Mars. And as the doors close, there's going to be this issue. 
how do they jump the entire American world culture up to what would be a, or over a gigantic gap in, in non-truth, non, non non-truth history too. We're beyond right. Mars, we'll be archeology. span And we know from P other whistleblowers, we're even involved in interstellar trade routes. That disconnect between what is actually happening and the world that we are on and the stuff that we are fed. Right now, to me, Jimmy, I really do think that it would be a tremendous waste, just a tremendous waste if they don't take advantage of this 180 day countdown to finally literally open up something that is seriously substantive. And now, Nick, uh, uh, to Linda's point, and I have to uh, agree with her on this, could we have something stated in that report? Okay, something's going on, but it ain't ours. There's something going on here, but we don't have answers. Could we actually cross that kind of line? Yes. <laughs> I... I'm afraid I'm going to be pessimistic and say no. Um, Why? You're too British. <laughs> well, because, because in, just in, in my experience of the government, the military, the intelligence community reporting back to, well, in my case, it would be a, par a British parliamentary committee. That, that simply isn't language that, that we would use. I mean, I, I just can't conceive that we would say something like that. I think, as I say, the, the furthest we would go is uh, with the best will in the world, we cannot hope to identify all such sightings. But I don't, I, so I'm afraid I'm going to, I'm, I'm, you know, I hope I'm wrong. Look, I hope I'm wrong. But if you ask me to make a prediction, I'm afraid I'm going to say no. That's that's not going to go into the report. Because Nick, do me one favor. They, they never Nick, like to. Yeah. Yeah. Do me one favor. Say issues. Issues. I love Pentagon. that. <laughs> okay, uh, Linda. You Jimmy, but see. Well, but Jim, Linda brings Jimmy, up the best point. Let, let okay, me, go let ahead. me ask you a question, uh, Jimmy. I'll back up with yes. all all of the work that you've done in radio and all yes. of the work I've done in TV and all. Quite seriously, how much longer can this planet keep going into getting to Mars? We're gonna be mining in the asteroid belt and not telling planet Earth the truth about other life forms in this universe that so many layers of our intel community and, and military people know firsthand. That's yeah, too big a gap. But that's exactly the point. And, and Nick, I want to know, the, you know what the world wants to know, Nick? At the MOD, behind the walls, in the office, I don't think the conversation is are these real? What is going on? I don't think that's the conversation. I think the yeah. conversation that is going on in there is a direct conversation about these issues. Issues. What? How was it rep, uh, referenced behind the walls? I don't think there's any second guessing or reading between the lines in these conversations. I think it's a direct conversation about ET. Yeah, there are certainly discussions that have taken place along the lines of, look, if this is what some of us think it is, there's a technology here and and we would like that technology. Now, inevitably, those those conversations, and I've said this before, if you embed a government UFO program in the military or in the Department of Defense, that those are the conversations that you will get. And they will be very much configured on, is there a threat or is there an opportunity in terms of technology acquisition or is there both? If you follow the French model and you embed 
your UFO program not in the DOD, but in the French National Space Center, you will get different conversations and you will get much more open scientific conversations about, you know, other life forms and what their home worlds might be like and and those sorts of things. But so it, you are you're trapped. You're trapped by where you put the program. So to answer your question, yeah, behind closed doors in the MOD, those conversations, whether they're speculative or whatever, they are they tend to be threat orientated and technology acquisition orientated conversations. Uh, but my point is, and I'm asking you a very direct question here, Nick, I don't think that the conversations are, if these are what we think they are, no, I don't think that's the conversation. I think the conversation is, ET came here again last night, we were talking to them last week, uh, we've got some other things that are going on. That's a direct conversation, not if these are what we think they are. I, I don't think that's the conversation going on behind closed. I, I just don't. No, it's absolutely. Our government and the United States and UK, Australia, New Zealand, Canada, the allies of World War II have been talking with each other at very classified intel levels uh, since during World War II and after about the Foo Fighters, the um, eventually the bodies, the bodies that under autopsy reports were clearly nothing having to do with Earth. I want to thank both of you for uh, not only uh, what you do in the community, but hanging out with me and and having a very open conversation with everybody. I'm not even looking at the camera. I'm looking at the two of you. You guys are friends and thank you so much. I like the way Nick didn't answer the question. Linda did. I want to know what goes on behind closed doors. Nick, thank you so much, my friend. All the best. I think 2021 is going to be very exciting. I'm looking forward to these reports for sure. I think something's going to break and I agree with you. It's going to be what we least expect. Linda, thank you so much. And uh, I, I just can't say enough. Thank you. And listen, maybe you should take a vacation. Don't don't no. go and make it a don't make it a no. working vacation. <laughs> no, no, no. I, I, I like I like exploring. <laughs> Nick, hi. <laughs> hi and bye. <laughs> hey there. Yeah, Nick, thank you so much. Linda, thank you so much. Uh, the 2021 Conscious Life Expo wouldn't be what it was without the two of you. Thank you so much.